talk on refuting compatibility of quantum marginals. Uh, it's joint work with Nikolai Widerka. I think he also joins uh, TQC today or tomorrow from University of Dusseldorf. That's him. And um, so what's the problem? What's this quantum marginal problem? It asks, given a set of quantum marginals, so reduced k-body reduced states, so reduced density matrices, when does there exist a joint quantum state? So here we have two very simple scenarios. On the left, we are given the marginals on subsystem A, on subsystem B, and on subsystem C. And of course, that state is always compatible by simply taking the tensor product of these three states. Uh, on the right-hand side is this archetypical example where this compatibility does not work. Uh, given some marginals on AB, on AC, and BC, they're not always compatible. And the simplest example is just to take, um, to ask that AB, AC, and BC are singlets or bell states, and then we see that every of these two-body reduced density matrices, density matrices uh, is pure, but of course that's not compatible with other pure states. Uh, on this topic, a lot, but not everything is known. Uh, we have entropic inequalities, uh, there are eigenvalue inequalities, uh, operator inequalities, entropic, for example, are subadditivity or strong subadditivity. Uh, inequalities, uh, operator inequalities can have um, their in matrix form. So now I don't have a blackboard here, but um, um, uh, for example, if you have uh, two body marginals, then the operator identity minus row A minus row B minus row C plus row AB plus row BC plus row AC is always positive, semi definite. Um, there, are, uh, there exist eigenvalue inequalities for the one body reduced density matrix problem. Um, so if you have a bipartite system and I give you the eigenvalues for subsystem A and B, what are, the, what are the constraints on the eigenvalues on the joint system AB? That exists for bi and tripartite systems. Um, there are algorithms with guarantees that can find you a joint state with given one body marginals. So this is for the non-overlapping case. That is this case when the marginals uh, don't overlap, but you ask for a global properties say that the global state is pure. And then there are special cases. You have, a, say, you have pure states with maximally mixed marginals, so-called absolutely maximal entangled states, and um, also, also quantum codes. And this has relations to uh, Kronecker coefficients, so um, from the representation th theory of the symmetric group, to Horn's inequalities. So these are inequalities that tell you, given I have matrices, well, it's, it's okay. I think it's okay. Given if I have matrix, a matrix A with some spectrum, a matrix B with some spectrum, what is the possible uh, spectrum of the matrix A plus B? These are Horn inequalities. They constrain that. It's also known as the sum of Hermitian matrices problem. In fact, that sum of Hermitian matrices problems, A and B and A plus B, is equivalent to the quantum marginal problem when you have a joint state on row AB, and subsystem A and subsystem B. And their uh, interesting relations to geometric invariant theory, to moment cones, tensor scaling, and quantum codes. Okay, so the general quantum marginal problem, as I described it, you can formulate it as an STP. Um, so let's say we want these marginals A, B, B, C, and A, C. How do we do that with a computer? Find me some positive semi definite operator X that has trace one for which the marginals on the subsystems are the correct ones, right? And then your computer will solve that problem. Um, now, we'll go to, the, the, this talk actually addresses a, a related problem, uh, which we, I call the spectral quantum marginal problem. So it's almost the same, but except uh, instead of this, having these marginals A, B, we have now the spectrum of that subsystem. So there's a list of eigenvalues, non-zero eigenvalues on subsystem A, B, and B, C, and A, C. So given this spectra, we ask, does there exist a joint state Rho ABC such that the spectra on the reduced states, they match um, these given prescribed spectra. And in fact, this is equivalent to a version of Horn's eigenvalues and some of Hermitian matrices problems where you have three matrices, A, B, and C, and then sums A, B, and B, C, and so on. Okay? And it also corresponds to the non-negativity of Kronecker-like coefficients where you couple three times the representation of the symmetric group. All right, this is clearly not an STP, but what do we do <laughs> when we have a problem which is not an STP? We try to introduce some kind of STP hierarchy. Yeah? And exactly that's the result of this talk. 
Uh, there's an STP hierarchy for detecting spectral incompatibility. Um, this hierarchy is complete in the sense that if the spectra, the prescribed spectra on the reductions are incompatible, uh, this hierarchy will at some level tell you, yes, these are in incompatible and, and will produce you an incompatibility witness. Um, also, the interesting thing is this hierarchy is dimension free, which means once you have a witness for incompatibility, this witness is valid in all dimensions. Um, so once you solve this problem, say, on, on uh, three two trits, then the inequalities you get out of it will also be valid for 3,000 L systems. Okay, how do we, so the rest of the talk, I just want to convince you that this is possible. And it relies on a, on a, on a couple of facts. Um, first, I want to introduce how permutations act on tensor product spaces. So let's say we have an element from the symmetric group, sigma and Sn, and we let it permute the tensor factors of CD tensor N as they're done in the first line. So we have sigma acting on this tensor product, the V1 until tensor Vn, and it just exchanged the places. So here, example is easy to see if the permutation one, four, three, uh, this cycle and the one cycle two acts on this product, then the vector at position one goes to position four, the vector at position four goes to position three, and the vector at position three goes to position one while the two is fixed. What can we do with this? A very simple fact, also known as the swap trick. Um, if you have this permutation, let's say a cycle one, two, three, until L, acting on K copies of some operator, rho tensor K, and here K has to be bigger than L, of course, or bigger equal, otherwise it's not well defined. And you take the trace, and what you get, you get sort of the case, uh, uh, sorry, the Lth purity. So you get rho to the power of L and the trace of it, which is, of course, just by diagonalization, the sum of all the Lth powered eigenvalues. Uh, often people just use this in terms of uh, trace of swap applied to A times B. It's the same as trace of A. The trace of swap applied to A tensor B is the same as the trace of A times B. So this is the general version. And here, this is the illustration. So first, you, you start with each little box row, and then the trace would just connect one box, the output of one box, to the input of the same box, so the cat to the bra. But now, actually, because this permutation acts, uh, instead of going here, it will go to the next one. And the same happens here. And then you get rho to the power of L and the trace of it. So we have the same fact also works on marginals. So now I define this permutation one dot 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 L, so that's an L cycle, uh, on to act on some subsystem A. A can now have be an arbitrary size. Um, so it acts on all the subsystems that are contained in A. Then if I let this act on A, uh, and of course I have to act with the identity on the complement uh, on rho tensor k, then I simply get the marginal on subsystem A to the power of L and the trace of it, which gives me the eigenvalues to the power of L on that subsystem, yeah? And uh, it's, it's, the, it's the eigenvalue power sum. And here is the illustration again. So let's say this is subsystem A, these two same systems together, uh, and then I act with this cycle, it will um, contract me all these uh, copies while here I just get a partial trace on the A complement. And here I did an, is another illustration uh, where I actually chose three subsystems, also called here A, that's a bit unfortunate, but I have the cycle acting on AB with identity on C uh, on many copies and it gives me rho AB to the power of L and the trace. So why do I tell you this? I just want to convince you that once I have copies available of, um, of my density matrix, then I can naturally extract the spectrum from it. Now, the fact two that I need uh, is the so-called quantum Definetti theorem. What does it say? Let's say we have some rho sub L acting on L, L, uh, L um, uh, Hilbert spaces. And if for this state rho L, there exists a larger state, ideally very large one, rho K, uh, which is permutation symmetric and for which the reduction looks like rho L, then if K becomes very large, or if this is true for all K, all natural number Ks, then we know that this reduction of this very big state rho K um, can be uh, written as a convex combination of tensor products of rho. 
And this gives us a sequence of outer approximations of these states rho to the tensor of L, right? And that's what we want to get the spectrum back because in the slide before I showed you how if, whoops, sorry, if you have access to many copies of the state, um, then you can infer the spectrum from it. All right, and now we have a relaxation for compatibility. Um, if there exists a state that is compatible with a spectrum subsets uh, in A, corresponding to this power sum, then the following uh, set of STPs are feasible. So for every K, it's possible to find a solution to this program. Um, find me a positive semi-definite operator XK, which is permutation symmetric, and which for all these subsets A satisfies this relation, right? So this is the spectral relation. And of course, this is a, this is a relaxation. This doesn't quite um, do what I uh, promised to do, namely to have a complete hierarchy, but I'll show this later. Uh, for now, I just want to show you that this relaxation uh, works. Um, how do we use this? So now we have, a, we have a sequence of relaxations of a feasibility program. If the dual program is feasible and unbounded, so in this case, negative unbounded, so the, 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 the objective value goes to minus infinity, then this proves by duality that uh, the primal is infeasible and consequently the spectral the spectra are incompatible. So the idea is to write down a, a semi-definite programming hierarchy, which has to be feasible if the spectra are compatible, and then to uh, work out the dual. And if the dual uh, is unbounded and feasible, then this is a, uh, a non-existence proof of a joint state with these given spectra. Okay, we have one problem. We started with many copies of a multipartite state that grows really, really, really big on a computer. Um, so the STP is simply too big, right? If you start with a three-partite state and you take three copies, then you have nine qubits and say, on my, on my laptop, that doesn't work. But uh, what we can do now, we, we, we can identify the symmetries of this program and then just symmetry reduce this semi-definite program. So what are, what are the symmetries on the single system? Oops. Well, we have, uh, we have this permutation acting on the roll k and this is directly related to the spectra, or the power sum of the spectra, and we know the spectrum of a matrix really doesn't depend on the local basis, right? So in this context, it means that uh, we can uh, rotate it with U tensor K on both sides, and this, uh, uh, the, the, this trace will be still the same. Now for n partite system, actually the same holds, uh, so for every, we have permutations acting on some subsets A, and uh, if we fine grain out these unitaries up there uh, into U1 till UN, uh, and let it act K times, then it's all also invariant under that operation. And of course, the reason for this is that um, we have the sure while duality, so that means that uh, if we have permutation acting on tensor product states by uh, permuting the subsystems, then this operation commutes with, with acting with K copies of the same unitary. Yeah, so for all sigma in SK and all unitaries in unitary group, these two actions commute. And what it means, like, you can, you can decompose CD tensor K, so single system, uh, tens K times, into uh, a direct sum of subspaces on which uh, the unitary group acts here on the left tensor factor and the symmetric group on the right tensor factor. Uh, these are indexed by these lambdas. They stand for, young, uh, for, 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 uh, for tableaus or partitions of, of K. And uh, if you work with D-level systems, then uh, we have to limit this height of these tableaus to be smaller or equal than D. Now, if you have uh, K copies of, of n-partite systems, it's es essentially exactly the same. We simply take, uh, so where's this N going? Um, so we have CD tensor K, of course these two can be exchanged. So we have n times such an expression. Yeah? So we have n times a partition, lambda one to lambda n. And what this allows is to check positivity of the dual variable of our semi-definite program in the individual irreps only, and that makes the thing very small. So how does this work in practice? Um, I open Sage Math to this gives you um, this program gives you the irreducible representations of the symmetric group. Here, uh, there's different. Well, 
they're all equivalent, of course, but th there's different types of uh, representations, for example, young normals form and so on. And here we have to choose a unitary representation or orthonormal one. Why? Because positivity um, really needs a star representation. We have a positivity, uh, a positive matrix is a, or a positive operator in these type of algebras is a sum of Hermitian squares. And what we need is that uh, Hermitian corresponds to Hermitian in the group ring or taking the inverse. Yeah? So we need that the inverse of an element really corresponds to the transpose, which is uh, the real case for, me, uh, for Hermitian. But uh, uh, all these representations are real, so uh, it doesn't matter. And then we take every combination of these EREPs. For example, if you have three copies of, of a three qubit state, then um, on, subs, on the first subsystem, say we take uh, this representation, on the second copies, uh, three copies of the second subsystem, we take this EREP, and the third, for example, this one, and then uh, these are the completely symmetric subspaces, and uh, we know that each one has dimension one, and the, uh, the, the joint subsystem, uh, the, the, this block of the symmetry reduction has also dimension one, and so on. So we see that uh, we now can, uh, the three copies of a three qubit state actually reduce to uh, this uh, nine qubit Hilbert space reduces to blocks of dimension one, two, four, and eight, which is much, much smaller. And uh, for those who not, are not so familiar with representation theory, these blocks here are really these partitions uh, of, of uh, the number of copies. Uh, so this means, uh, for example, these blocks means we have two plus one is three. This means three equals three. And then there would be the one plus one plus one equals three, but it's not there because, uh, because we work with qubits here. Uh, what's the effects of this? First of all, it reduces the STP size massively. Uh, we can work with up to five copies of uh, three-partite states of arbitrary dimensions. Um, also what happens is that these incompatibility witnesses, they can certify incompatibility in all dimensions. So we call them dimension-free. Uh, so if the number of copies that we use in a program is smaller or equal to the local dimension, then these witnesses, they really certify uh, incompatibility of the spectra in all dimensions. And one way to see this is that these, in, these witnesses, uh, these are purity or moment inequalities. How do they look like? Here's an example. Yeah. So these we found numerically. If you work with uh, um, uh, any kind of tripartite system, rho ABC, they will satisfy these relations. Yeah. So here is one of degree two, where we have purities of degree two involved. And here we have one uh, that involves degree two, three, and four. And what we do if we have, um, or the way to act as witness is that um, these were produced by giving some kind of spectrum to the computer to ask whether it's compatible, and the computer will spit out this equation, and the, the spectrum will violate these equations. Yeah. Here's some uh, plot where you can see how taking more copies approximates um, the incompatibility. So here, what we took is we, we, we took some assumptions for uh, for the local spectra. We said, okay, maybe it's just rank two, uh, lambda a b and one minus lambda a b, and the AC system the same, on the BC system the same, and then for every combination of of uh, spectrum a on on the two body subsystems, um, you get a curve. And here you see, for example, the violet. When you take two copies, you get this curve, and then with four copies, you get this curve, and with five copies, you get the the tighter one. Now, before I said they're dimension-free, and here I talk about constraining the rank, but the point is, once your computer, uh, these spectra just act as an input to, to the to this semi-definite pro, uh, programming hierarchy, but once you get a, a valid bigness that is valid in all dimensions, it really doesn't any, matter anymore um, how, um, what, what the constraints are on the uh, actual eigenvalues, because what, what it really works with is it works with the power sums of the eigenvalues. Okay, now I have three minutes to convince you that this program is also complete, because for now I just showed you a, a, a relaxation of the problem. So the problem here is that uh, this quantum Lefinetti theorem, it converges to the convex sum of rho times rk. And for this to be, for this hierarchy to be exact, we really need that um, the, the STP hierarchy converges to rho times rk. And the solution here, which is kind of funny, is to add quadratic constraints. So here's the type of quadratic constraint. This is one a spectral constraint that you want that this cycle evaluates to 
lambda i times r to the power of l, this power sum, and then the way you can act these quadratic constraints is to, 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 to take them twice. So you take this one and, and this one and the second set of sub-indices, and you let it act on x to the k on, on our variable. And um, now this, this is kind of funny. This is a quadratic expression, so it's non-negative for all permutation symmetric operators x, k. Um, and uh, if it now satisfies, if this constraint is zero for all um, for all levels of the hierarchy, then um, this constraint implies that uh, this reduction is uh, this convex combination of quantum definite is actually a convex combination of compatible states, of states with compatible spectra, up to some measure zero. Okay, and this, with this we have completeness. That means uh, this hierarchy detects every incompatible state. Uh, this is the complete uh, theorem that I probably don't want to explain, but you see you essentially just have uh, these individual irreducible star representations where you check positivity over. So what are the contributions here? Uh, I presented you a complete and dimension-free hierarchy for the overlapping spectral marginal problem that I can deal with problems like here, where you are given the spectrum of these two-body marginals. And the interesting part, I think, is that um, this type of multilinearization, going using quantum definite and using these quadratic constraints, this allows a, a complete STP hierarchy for a seemingly non-STP problem. And uh, it also gives you a new toolbox for purity inequalities and also optimizing equivariant expressions. In principle, um, you can find all the purity inequalities that exist in this manner. And uh, now I take also the advantage to advertise that there will be soon PhD and postdoc positions open in Bordeaux. So if you like surfing and you like science, talk with me. And uh, yeah, thanks. That's it. Right, thank you very much uh, for a nice talk. We have plenty of time for questions, so please we can, we can ask. The floor is open for discussion. Yep. Thanks for the nice talk. I was, uh, so I was just wondering, like, um, how much is no, so obviously if you have spectral incompatibility, it's also the case that uh, it implies incompatibility of the underlying states, right? Like the, right, so, so, that, so this implies that. How much is known about like the spectral compatibility problem? Like, I, mean, I don't know much about the full field, so I was just wondering how easy is it to certify that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, for non-overlapping ones. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's where it's probably more known to. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? Well, you think I would ask a simple and stupid question, probably. You, you said that uh, your result is dimension-free when k is smaller than d, right? So when the number of subsystems is smaller than dimension, what happens when it's not, right? So when it's, when it's smaller, uh, then... Or it's larger, sorry, when it's more larger. you just get um, inequalities which are valid for that local dimension. But ah, okay. The funny thing is you can actually tune it. Mm -hmm. I mean, in general, whenever you have... Um, uh, then you cut off some boxes, Mm -hmm. When you don't take all partitions, when you don't take all the answer blocks available okay. in, your, in, your, in your optimization program, then you might get inequalities which are not valid for that dimension. Okay. So when you choose all of them, then simply by the fact that the representation sort of saturates, mm -hmm. you won't get new representations. When you I see, okay. But in okay. principle, you can tune it exactly to the dimension that you want, and then uh, nice. you, you all right. in principle also, um, yeah, you see, you see how the compatibility changes also with, with changing the local dimension. So you might have purity inequalities, which are valid in low dimensions, but mm -hmm. in high. All right, thanks. Okay, makes sense. Any other any other questions? Oh yeah, here. Um, yeah, hey, uh, nice talk. Um, so I'm just trying to visualize. Th this gives like uh, if if you think the, about the not about the overlapping quantum marginal problem. Does what does this tell us? It tells us about an outer approximation of this convex set. Is that right? It's well, not quite right. Yeah. So, but when you move to the new right, it sort of becomes convex. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and this is good one from Fridge. Fridge you can actually show that it connects all. Um, it's a lot of six search points which connect all of these and make IP Okay. Does it tell you anything about? Does it give you any tricks to sort of? Solving ground state problems, uh, like you know, because that's sort of like if you can solve the overlapping quantum marginal problem, then you can solve a, gra a ground state problem, you know, or energy minimization problem. So, uh. I don't know. okay. But of course, it has the also scale five in some sense, like it has to for a scale of ground problem. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't see. So let's thank Felix again.